So excited. I want to dive straight into this message. I have a lot of scripture to read. I make no apologies for reading it. We are in church. We are going to read the Bible. Uh, we, are in, we are in a series called Family, Friends, and Foes. This is the third week. Uh, the first week I talked about Samuel. Um, and last week, uh, Pastor Preston talked about Goliath. And this week, I have the enviable task of talking about somebody in David's life that we all know about uh, and that many of us already have um, an emotion about. We already have this person judged and uh, most of us hate him. If we don't hate him, we loathe him. If we don't loathe him, we strongly dislike him. And I feel like my assignment today uh, is, to humanate, is to humanize who most of us have hated. And it's Saul. And so uh, I want to talk about this man and I want to go back to his origin story. I want to go back to where it all started for him, because Saul did not start off the way most of us have him in our minds. And so um, because I have so much scripture to read, I want to give you the title of the message up front uh, and then we'll pray because once I start, I ain't going to stop. Uh, until I'm done, then I'll say bye-bye and we'll be done, all right? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter number nine. If you're taking notes on this message, and you should be taking notes because nerds rule the world. Um, if you're taking notes on this message, three words, please write this down. The title of this message is Better See Saul. I like the 15 of you that know <laughs> where this might be coming from. But it's a double entendre. Uh, the first is an exhortation. There's an urgency that I want you to have, which, which is you better see Saul. Because if you don't see Saul, uh, you can wind up being severely hurt and wounded by Saul. So you better see Saul. Uh, but with a different inflection, I also want you to better see Saul. I want you to understand that this man didn't get the way he wound up by himself. And that if we can see him in a different way, perhaps we can approach him with a little more empathy. It doesn't excuse anything that he's done, but perhaps we can have more empathy for him understanding his origins. So first Samuel chapter number nine. Let me pray. And then we're going straight in. God, help us not to be Saul. Amen. <laughs> so first uh, Samuel chapter number nine. Start, I pray really quick. <laughs> Verse number one, here's what it says. There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bacorath, son of Aphiah of the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Can we just stop right there? This is already starting off good. We talked about David two weeks ago. They described him as handsome, dark skinned, me. <laughs> Saul's not just the most handsome man in his family or his tribe. He's the most handsome man in all of Israel. And he's taller than anyone else in the entire nation. This is already starting off good for him. It's a good look. One day, Kish's donkey strayed away and he told Saul, take a servant with you and go look for the donkey. So Saul took one of the servants and traveled through the hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalisha, the Shalaim area, and the entire land of Benjamin. But they couldn't find the donkeys anywhere. Finally, they entered the region of Zuf, and Saul said to his servant, let's go home. By now, my father will be more worried about us than about the donkeys. But the servant said, I've just thought of something. There was a man of God who lives here in this town. He is held in high honor by all the people because everything he says comes true. Let's go find him. Perhaps he can tell us which way to go. But we don't have anything to offer him, Saul replied. Even our food is gone and we don't have a thing to give him. Well, the servant said, I have one small silver piece. We can at least offer it to the man of God and see what happens. In those days, if people wanted a message from God, they would say, let's go and ask the seer for prophets used to be called seers. All right. Saul agreed. Let's try it. 
So they started into town where the man of God lived. As they were climbing the hill to the town, they met some young women coming out to draw water. So Saul and his servant asked, is the seer here today? Yes, they replied. Stay right on this road. He is at the town gates. He has just arrived to take part in a public sacrifice up at the place of worship. Hurry and catch him before he goes up there to eat. The guests won't be the guests won't begin eating until he arrives to bless the food. So they entered the town and as they passed through the gates, Samuel was coming out toward them to go up to the place of worship. Now, the Lord had told Samuel the previous day about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him to be the leader of my people, Israel. He will rescue them from the Philistines for I have looked down on my people in mercy and have heard their cry. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, that's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. Just then Saul approached Samuel at the gateway and asked, can you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up to the place of worship ahead of me. We will eat there together. And in the morning, I'll tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. And don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago, for they have been found. Gangster. So, I mean, Samuel is a real prophet. This dude knows everything. And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Saul replied, but I am from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel. And my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me like this? Let's jump to 1 Samuel chapter number 10. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. When you leave today, you will see two men beside Rachel's tomb at Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will tell you that the donkeys have been found and that your father has stopped worrying about them and is now worried about you. He is asking, have you seen my son? When you go to the Oak of Tabor, you will see three men coming towards you who are on their way to worship God at Bethel. One will be bringing three young goats. Another will have three loaves of bread and the third will be carrying a wineskin full of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves, uh, two of the loaves, which you are to accept. When you arrive at Gibeah of God, where the garrison of the Philistines is located, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the place of worship. They will be playing a harp, a tambourine, a flute and a lyre, and they will be prophesying. At that same time, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. After these signs take place, do what must be done for God is with you. Then go down to Gilgal ahead of me. I will join you there to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. You must wait for seven days until I arrive and give you further instructions. As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart and all of Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. Now jump to verse number 17. Later, Samuel called all the people of Israel to meet before the Lord at Mizpah. And he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel has declared. I brought you from Egypt and rescued you from the Egyptians and from all the nations that were oppressing you. But though I have rescued you from your misery and distress, you have rejected your God today and have said, no, we want a king instead. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by tribes and clans. So Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. Then he brought each of the family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord and the family of the Matrites was chosen. And finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. So they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding among the baggage. So they found him and brought him out and he stood head and shoulders above anyone else. Then Samuel said to all the people, this is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in all Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, long 
Live the king. Great story, right? Sounds good thus far. Let's jump now to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, starting at the 10th verse. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king. Dang, what has happened? <laughs> In five chapters that the Lord is so sorry that he made this dude a king. I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. <laughs> then he went on to Gilgal. When Samuel finally saw him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you. He said, I have carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear? Samuel demanded. Uh, man, it's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats and the cattle, Saul admitted. Uh, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God. Uh, your God? Like not possessive, like but yours, not mine. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you? Saul asked. And Samuel said, and Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. We need to better see Saul. Saul's entire career as king starts off great. But then there is this shift and this pivot between chapters 10 and 15 that make God say emphatically, I've seen enough. I believe that it was important to read the portions of scripture that we read because this is pre-interaction with David. I want you to see, and we will see clearly, that who Saul was with David was already in him prior to meeting him. So David didn't make any of this come out of him. This was already pre-existent. But for some reason, Saul found it very difficult to embrace the purpose and the plan that God had for his life. So the first thing that I want to address and the first thing I want to highlight for you all is that are the things that are easy to see in Saul. Let's talk about first what's easy to see in Saul. The stuff that's just readily evident and available when you read about his life, you're like, oh, yeah, Saul's this, Saul's that, Saul's him. Here's the first thing. Saul has a quick temper. Saul has a short fuse. He cannot manage his emotions. Time did not afford me the opportunity to read all the way through. If we did, and I invite you to go back and look, the first battle that Saul takes his soldiers into is fueled by his anger. Anger is a wonderful emotion. It's an emotion that should inform you of what to do next. Anger lets you know when a boundary has been violated. Anger lets you know when an injustice has incurred. Anger should inform you about something that needs to happen next. It should inform you. It should not identify you. If you're just an angry person, if you find solace in your anger, they know not to run up on me because I'm not about that life. <laughs> I'll let somebody know right now. I ain't the one. That's much different than having a boundary cross and then you getting angry or seeing an injustice and you being angry. Saul had a short quick temper. Let me tell you another thing that's easy to 
spot and to see in Saul. Saul is impulsive. Anger usually blinds your cognition and your reasoning. And he's impulsive. Samuel, we read that Samuel tells him, I need you to go over here. And when you get there, wait for me and I will come and do the sacrifices and offer up the burnt offerings. What you will read if you take the time to go back and peruse it is that Saul got tired of waiting for Samuel. And so he decides to offer up the sacrifices himself. Samuel gave him a, a, a very clear directive. Wait until I get there and I will make the sacrifices and offer up the burnt offerings. And Saul, who is like, mm, 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 he still ain't here. I'm gonna do it myself. So he goes and does all the burnt offerings. He does. He goes and does all the sacrifices. And I love the timing. As soon as he's done, that's when Samuel rose up. When Samuel rose up, he goes, Saul, wh what are you doing? And Saul's response is the next thing that's easy to see in Saul. Saul is a blame shifter. Instead of owning the disobedience of not waiting on the prophet Samuel to do the offering and to lift up the sacrifices, Saul automatically starts to blame shift. Well, you know, my troops were getting tired and you were late. So it's not me. Wait a minute, Saul. Are you? Samuel's late? Yeah, Sam, you weren't here on time. Samuel never gave you a time that he would show up. He just told you he would be here at some point. But when you are impulsive and a blame shifter, you can never just own your mistake. You always shift the blame to someone else. If you would have did this, then I would have done that. If you'd have been here on time, I wouldn't have had to disobey. If you would have done your thing, then I would have done my thing. Which leads to the next thing that's easy to see in Saul. Saul expects everyone's sentiment to align with his. There's a reckless episode in these short chapters and verses that I skipped where Saul is so focused on his enemies that he literally says to his soldiers, no one's going to eat until we've eradicated all of my enemies and I've exacted my revenge. This is after they've spent a long time already battling enemy forces. They're tired. They're hungry. And he literally says, no one's going to eat until all my enemies are dead, until I've had my full revenge. The place where they're resting has honeycomb all around, something that would have given them energy to continue to battle. But Saul, selfishly, wants everyone to have the same sentiment he has about whatever situation he's in. Hey, that person offended me. You need to be just as mad at them as I am. I just fell out with that person. You better not talk to that person. That business deal went bad. You shouldn't go over and frequent that business anymore. Saul wants you to feel the exact same way about a person and about a situation as he does. And if you don't, it's a sign of disloyalty. He makes this irrational and irresponsible edict, right? No one's going to eat until we've done the battle. And if they do, may the Lord bring a curse upon them. Guess what, y'all? Jonathan wasn't there when his daddy made this declaration. So later on, Jonathan just rocks up, skipping. What's up, everybody? And he sees the honey. He's like, ooh, honey. He gets some of the honey. He's like, oh, this is so refreshing. And all the soldiers are like, ooh, your daddy going to get you. And he's like, what? What are you talking about? Your dad said that anybody that eats anything before all of his enemies are vanquished, he, he, he said a curse is going to come upon him. And Jonathan, as a son, had to be thinking, that's my dad. He, he wouldn't trip out like that. You don't know your daddy. 
So they wind up having to cast lots, uh, which was one of the ways uh, in the Old Testament they knew uh, what the Lord's will was or to reveal uh, what needs to be happening. They cast lots and it falls on Jonathan. Saul winds up, Jonathan is the one who ate something before all his enemies had vanquished. And you know what Saul's response is once he finds out it's his son? So sorry, son. I have to kill you. This dude was going to kill his son over his own vengeance. Well, I said it, I'm going to have to do it even if it means you. And here's what I love about the soldiers. These are Saul's soldiers. They step in between Saul and Jonathan and they actually buck up on Saul and they're like, hey, bro, no, I, I don't care. You're not going to kill your son over this, over some honey. We talking about honey right now. I'm not going to let you do it. I love me some people who will speak truth to power. I love me some people that say, even if I get fired, you're not going to do this today. They would not let Saul do it. And we know that Saul was in his flesh because he stands down. He knows he was wrong but he can't admit it. Which brings me to the next thing that's very, very easy to see in Saul. Saul only apologizes when he fears losing or has lost. The only time Saul will ever apologize is when he fears losing or he already has lost. He has to be pinned so far in a corner before he'll say, my bad, that was me. And you're like, we know it was you. We've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. We knew it was you when we first came in here and told you it was you. The fact that it takes you an hour and 15 minutes later to admit it was you is why you drive us crazy. And let me tell you what drives us even more crazy is that when you finally apologize, we know you don't mean it. Here's Saul. Hey, Samuel. What's up? I just came from Carmel. I'm building a monument to myself because, you know, I'm that dude. Samuel goes, why are you so giddy? You were supposed to eradicate your enemies. And he's like, I have done that. He goes, then why do I still hear cattle and goats and sheep? You haven't taken anything. He's like, okay, bro. Yo, yes, we kept this stuff, but we're going to sacrifice it to the Lord. So like, it's cool. Here's what a person like Saul always does. They take what God says and they interpret it for their own benefit. God, I heard what you said. Oh, you want me to apologize to my dad? Absolutely. You want me to do it this week? Listen, That's inconvenient. He lives in Maine. Tickets this time of year. Thanksgiving, he's going to be in this area anyway because he wants to see the grandkids. He's going to come with mom. So you know what? I am going to do it. I'm just going to do it on Thanksgiving. Let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that partial obedience is complete disobedience. You cannot take a thus said the Lord word and reinterpret it and execute it the way you want to do it. It is always his way or no way. That kind of goes with being a Lord. (laughs) It's not a suggestion. It's not a democracy. These are not constitutional laws that have been put there that can be amended. These are commandments that must be obeyed. Saul has no idea how to apologize. And when he does so, it's insincere. Which brings us to the last thing that's easy for me to see in Saul, is that Saul cares deeply about optics and image. He actually cares more about optics than he cares about the presence of God. When Samuel tells him, hey, 
Um, the Lord has rejected you as king. Saul's like, okay, listen, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry. I did wrong, my bad. Samuel's like, bro, it's too late. You, mm-mm. He already said no, so bye. He said, whoa, 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 okay, okay, okay. Okay, but, okay if you're gonna go, at least walk out with me so it at least looks like we're still good. Can, can we just, if God sends a prophet to tell me you're fired, but you're not losing your job, I'm going to roll around in the floor. Please, daddy, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, ah, I'll do anything. I'll do it. What do you want me to do? That's what David did in Psalm 51. Created me in a clean heart against thee and thee only have I sinned. This is not about anybody else. I want to make sure that I don't lose a connection with you. But when you're Saul, even if you lose a connection with God, you're like, can I still just have a connection for optics? Just make it, okay, all right, all right, I know you're mad, okay, you're, you're saying you're leaving. But, but, okay, but you still have to post the photos from our ski trip. I just don't want people to think, no, we're, we're going to get through this, but at least post so it looks like we're still in relationship. Instead of doing the real thing, you'd rather keep up the fake image. And Saul has no idea that God has moved on from him. Here was the scariest implication of Saul having these attributes. Remember we read Samuel telling Saul that as you walk away from me to step into this kingship, God is going to make you into a totally different person. And then scripture literally says that God gave Saul a new heart. Well, if Saul was given a new heart, how come we see this, this much of his behavior come out in this way? And the only conclu conclusion I can draw, ladies and gentlemen, is that although God gave him his heart, it does not mean Saul received it. Thank you for the new heart, Lord, but um, I kind of like my anger. I'm more familiar with that than the whole, like, you know, loving thing. Thank you for the new heart, Lord, but ooh, patience. Ooh. I need to get it done when I want to get it done. You know, I'm a, I'm a man on the move. I'm a grinder. I go get it. I'm about that life. I mean, your heart's, your heart's nice, but it's, it's too mushy. It's all soft and stuff. I, you know, uh-uh. People out here will hurt you. You got to have like a thick skin. I don't care you're leaving. I don't care. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit to you that Saul doesn't get this way by himself. Nobody gets this way by themselves. I submit to you that it's easy to hate somebody at a distance. It's incredibly hard to do up close. So I want to talk to you now about the things that's hard to see. In Saul. I want to talk about the things that are not as easily identifiable, but that might give you a little more empathy for this man. The first thing is that Saul never saw himself the way God saw him. If you were to ask me, hey, Tim, why do you think Saul's reign as king is so toxic? I believe that one of the main reasons is because he never saw himself the way God saw him. If I were to say it in even a stronger and more pointed way, he never agreed with God about the assignment God 
gave him. I want you to imagine if you're 30 years old and you're made a king. And after only a few short years, because Saul's entire reign was 42 years. I want you to imagine if you're 18 months on the job and God comes back and says, you are fired. But you still get to be king. But I ain't talking to you. You won't hear me. You won't really feel my presence. You won't have my guidance, not because I don't want to give it to you, but because you can't repent. Do you think you would be OK? Pop quiz. Would any of us be OK if we walked out of this room and never heard from God again? Pop quiz. Would anybody be OK walking out of this room and never feeling his presence again? Pop quiz. Would anybody in this room be a nice person if you no longer had the Holy Spirit on the inside of you? I'm so glad you were honest about that one. Sometimes it's hard for me to be nice with the Holy Spirit. So I know for a fact if he wasn't there, my pettiness would be unchecked. I just want you to imagine Saul being chosen as king and not having God's presence, not feeling his guidance, not having an updated word that had to be hell on earth for him. No wonder he was irritable. No wonder he experienced so much torment. He was disconnected from his God and anybody in any position of leadership, leading yourself, leading others without the presence of God is not going to be a healthy individual. Point blank, period. Second thing we see that's very difficult, but if you get past all the stuff you see on the outside and you look deeper, you realize Saul is very insecure. And once you realize and understand, oh, Saul is just insecure, then you can readily see where the jealousy comes from, where the pettiness comes from, where the vindictiveness comes from, where the manipulation comes from. If you're insecure, you are going to manifest all these other subset attributes. It's coming out of you. This man is the most handsome man in all of Israel. He stands head and shoulders above the rest. It doesn't matter if you have outward beauty, if you have inward insecurity. You're still not going to be OK with yourself. You can live in the best neighborhood behind the, be the biggest gate, drive the most expensive car. But if your soul has a hole in it, no one can pour enough love. No one can pour enough validation. No one can pour enough confirmation into you to make you be settled when you put your head on the pillow. And we know that this was his posture because when it was time for him to be coronated king, they couldn't find him. This tall joker went and found some bags to hide under. This is the tallest man in all of Israel with the best looks in all of the land. And we can't find him. His private coronation, he can handle. The public one, he couldn't. Why? He's insecure. Public coronation, dun 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 dun, pomp and circumstance, all of Israel show up. What are we doing? Crowning a king. Where is he at? We don't know. <laughs> as they get as they keep going through the process to get down to where he is, he just keeps getting lower. All of Israel line up. Oh, it's starting. Tribe of Benjamin. Oh, shoot. Clan of the Matrites. <sighs> Saul, son of Kish. No, no. If I just stand real still, hide behind these bags, they probably won't. They probably won't see me. Israel had to ask God, where is he? 
God said he's hiding amongst the baggage. You know why? Because God is a snitch. <laughs> God is a snitch. If you don't believe me, ask my kids. They don't get away with nothing. <laughs> Everything they try to do, the Holy Spirit drops a dime on me or Juliet, and we find out quick. Come home from date night, 11.45 at night. The Holy Spirit's like, run upstairs, go in the room right now. I run upstairs, bow, open the door. They're like, <sighs> do y'all have electronics up here? No? Get out the bed. Bed sweep. Bow, bow. Ah, mini iPad. Oh, so you thought we wasn't going to find out. You was born into the wrong family, son. We hear from God. You ain't getting away with nothing. Everything you do, God's going to tell us because he loves you too much. You in the wrong family to do dirt. Get right or get left. His insecurity made him hide. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Humility and insecurity are two different things. Humility says, I don't deserve this, but thank you. Thank you, God. I don't know why you chose me, but I accept it. Insecurity says, I don't know why you chose me. And at every turn, I will prove to you why I shouldn't be chosen. I will self-sabotage this thing as many ways as I can do it until you let me out of this deal. Because I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up to be vulnerable. I did not sign up to fill my heart. You gave me a new heart. I've rejected it because I need to protect the hard one I have. Which brings me to the last thing that's difficult and hard to see in Saul. And that is simply that Saul couldn't see Saul. Saul couldn't see himself. If Saul could see himself, I know for a fact he would have repented. If he could see how his behavior was impacting his family his children, his way of leading. I know he would have changed. No one in their right mind wants to walk around like Saul. Never in the history of eight-year-olds have you polled an eight-year-old and said, what do, what do you want to do when you grow up? And somebody's like, I would like to alienate myself from my family and friends because my toxicity and brokenness on the inside just repels people at all expense. I would like to grow up and be so self-absorbed that the hole is as big as a vortex and I just suck down joy and suck down pain in a way that makes the room flat. <laughs> and I hope to die lonely and bitter with 17 cats, <laughs> two parrots, <laughs> and one dog. Never in the history of eight-year-olds has it ever been said? Which lets me know Saul didn't get this way by himself. Brokenness did this to Saul. Pain did this to Saul. And we all know the adage that's popular in our culture now that hurt people hurt people. So the last thing I need to cover before we close is what to do with Saul? What do we do with Saul? Remember, Samuel is a necessity in our life. Goliath is unavoidable in our life. You may or may not interact with a Saul, but if you do, you better know how to handle Saul. I have empirical data on this because I've had to navigate some Saul's in my life. The first thing you have to do is that you have to create distance. When you're dealing with somebody as toxic as Saul, trying to reason with them is not going to work. You have to create distance. 
This is where we bring David into the story. We all know that when David killed Goliath, he wound up employed by Saul. Then he winds up in Saul's family. So this is not just David's king. This is also David's father-in-law. Saul is so tormented that he begins to throw javelins at his son-in-law, his wife's husband, while he's trying to play a harp. Bring, bring. <laughs> I'm sure the first javelin, he's trying to believe the best. There's no way he was trying to impel me against the wall. Perhaps he was just practicing. You know, he uses slings and swords and had to get his javelin throws in, and maybe he forgot I was playing here. Until the second one comes. <laughs> mm. Are we good? Or <laughs> I, I don't want to make assumptions. It just seems like. I want to believe the best. I think you're practicing javelin throws, and, but they keep coming like dangerously close <laughs> to my life, like they're, they're coming right here. Then the third one comes. And you know what David's response is? He leaves. Because when someone's trying to kill you, you don't pray about it. You bounce. Now, physical, absolutely, get up out of there. But if it's emotional, get up out of there. If it's relational, get up out of there. Because if they don't kill you physically, they start killing you mentally, emotionally, relationally. And then if you try to match what they're doing, you start killing yourself through your character and your integrity. Never try to match Saul's energy. You're not wired that way. It will kill you before it kills him. He's been this way his whole life. You're trying to be that way to survive him. No, create distance, go bye-bye. David didn't get around, hey, Jonathan, wifey, come here real quick. Hey, will y'all just be praying with me? Um, Saul, I just feel like Saul's trying to kill me, but I don't have a, a release in my spirit to leave yet. I'm just still waiting on the Lord to give me more confirmation. Is the confirmation to be impaled against a wall, David? No, when someone's trying to kill you, you don't have to pray about it. You just leave. Here's the second thing you have to do. Once you create distance, you have to create boundaries. It's the only way to deal with Saul. You have to create boundaries. Last passage of scripture I'll read, 1 Samuel chapter number 26, verses 21 through 25. Here's what it says. Then Saul confessed. Let me just give you the uh, preamble quickly. David has had two opportunities um, to confront Saul and really to kill Saul, to take his life, and he refuses to do it. And after the second time, Saul confesses. And here's what he says. I have sinned. Come back home, my son. I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. You would think David's response would be like, yay, daddy, king. Oh, my. I've been praying. This is all I ever wanted, man. This is what I've been praying. I'm so happy to hear you apologize. I miss Thanksgiving and Christmas with you. <laughs> Listen to David's response. Here is your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. Here's what David says. Nah, fam, we good. Stay where you are. I'm going to stay where I am. Let's get a third party to mediate in between us. You're toxic. I accept your apology and I'm going to keep my distance because while your apology might be valid, your actions are still toxic. 
And I don't want to repeat the cycle that I've already had with you. So get somebody to come get your spear. The Lord has given his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power. For you are the Lord's anointed. If you ever want to know the way to keep your heart pure is to never change your perspective about Saul, even when he or she hurts you. You're still the Lord's anointed. You're still a child of God. It's unfortunate that your actions have impeded us having a relationship, but I'm still going to call you a child of God. I still see you the way God sees you. God calls you his anointed. I call you his anointed. I won't change my narrative about you, even though what you've done has pained me so terribly. Now may the Lord value my life, even as he has valued yours today, even, even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. And Saul said to David, blessings on you, my son, David. You will do many heroic deeds and you will surely succeed. Then David went away and Saul returned home. As difficult as it was, to create those boundaries, I believe it saved David's life, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. Ladies and gentlemen, as I close, I just wanna tell you, I don't know if you've encountered a Saul or not. I'm not saying they are a prerequisite to getting through life, but if you have, my hope and my prayer is that you better see Saul. I know what he did hurt. I know that what he did caused pain. Perhaps it even cratered your soul, but I'm telling you right now, you have a choice of what you fill that crater with. If you fill it with bitterness, people will drown in it for the rest of their life. But if you fill it with grace, people will be refreshed by it for the rest of your life.